Hello, and welcome to the After Me Too Roundtable on Trauma. We're here to discuss recommendations for change when it comes to sexual misconduct in the film and television industry in Canada. My name is Tavia Grant, and I'm a reporter at The Globe. At the table, we have four esteemed experts, and uh, I started counting up some years of experience, and I got to a, over 100 years, which isn't to age you, but to show the, uh, the collective wisdom that we have here in um, examining trauma and sexual violence and prevention. Um, ask you to start just by introducing yourself, starting with um, Charlene. I'm Charlene Sen, and I'm a professor of psychology and women's and gender studies at the University of Windsor. I'm Jennifer Fried, and I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. And I'm Jim Hopper, and I'm a psychologist and an independent consultant, and I also teach at Harvard Medical School. I'm Laurie Haskell. I'm a clinical psychologist in Toronto, and I'm a trainer and a consultant. And we will start with reading aloud a case study. Um, this is fiction. So that is the end of this case study, and we will begin with, um, with an introduction of, of, from each of you about the areas of expertise in your work that relate to this, if you can keep it to sort of a layperson's perspective. So we're going to begin with, um, with Jennifer. So um, it's really striking in the case study and in what we're hearing about right now, how often sexual harassment and sexual assault involves betrayal. And we heard Leah say she felt betrayed in this case. And we saw the betrayal of people around her as well as the judicial system. Um, and for 25 years, my students and I have been studying betrayal. And we call, um, in particular, what we study betrayal trauma. And what we have found is that betrayal trauma is very toxic to people. It can really hurt them. Um, and cause them to suffer in various ways, although many people are also able to heal. Um, and a key issue for betrayal is that there's somebody in power or somebody the victim trusts who mistreats them, and this creates a terrible bind for a person because they have a need to maintain that relationship. In fact, that relationship may be essential to their very survival. Um, it may mean the difference between having a career or not having a career. And so being um, in that bind, they may suppress their detection of the betrayal in order to stay in that relationship, which is a survival skill, um, but it comes with a real cost. And one of the things our research has um, revealed is that there is often this kind of blindness, it affects memory, and um, there can be a cost. Um, but what's um, also revealed in this case, in, in the st stories we're hearing about in the paper, is the role of institutions in compounding that injury. So in this case, the police and the judicial system were unable to take care of this problem in a way that was informed and fair. And this likely would have caused additional harm and suffering for Leah. And we call this institutional betrayal, and we found that it too causes harm. Not all the news is bad news from the research that we do. As I mentioned, people can heal. And one of the crucial elements of healing is um, how people in the social environment respond after an event is disclosed. So response to disclosure is a really important way that one can combat betrayal and institutional betrayal. And so, um, even well-meaning people may respond in ways that are not helpful. So one of the important things we do for moving forward is teach people about what a good response looks like. And part of what a good response looks like is to validate and believe people, but it's also to respect them and give them their agency. There's one particular kind of really bad response that we also need to call out when we see it. And it's called, I call it DARVO, which stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And it's a response that's often employed by perpetrators when they're held accountable for their behavior. And it can be um, directed right at a victim, or it could be directed at a whistleblower who attempts to hold somebody accountable. And it takes the form of denying that the event occurred, um, saying, no, I didn't do that, but more sort of perniciously, it, it takes the form of attacking the person making 
the accusation. So if it's a victim saying, you know, you're, you're a liar and you're crazy. And then what's really, really um, powerfully potentially confusing to people is a reversal of victim and offender. So the, the accused perpetrator says, I'm the victim here. You're ruining my reputation. You're falsely accusing me. And that constellation of deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender can cause the victim to blame themselves and appear less credible than other people. But there's something we can do, which is identify it and call it out when it occurs. So we'll move on to Charlene, and we will return to a lot of these themes. Thank you. So I wanted to talk just about um, three sort of areas where there are solutions possible in the research that I do and, and that others have done. Um, there, in less than 80% of sexual assault situations, are there any bystanders present? But in most situations of sexual harassment and many of sexual assault, there were other people present, like in this case, when the problematic behavior first begins. And it, it is common for bystanders to take no action to help. Um, and as Jennifer's already described, the impact on the survivor is large, particularly where this becomes a systemic issue. But research has shown that most people in our workplaces actually want to help, but they just don't know how. And even worse, if others are also present, like in this party situation, people presume that other people will take the action, and so they don't need to. Um, and in fact, in research, we can show that the more people actually witness something, the less likely any one individual is to actually take any action. So. The other problem is that women who uh, sorry people who care about ending sexual violence and want to do things differently um, actually underestimate how hard it is to intervene in those kinds of situations. Um, and yet when we don't help, we actually experience considerable stress. So th there is a solution. And um, high quality bystander education is currently the best option for changing those kinds of experiences and actually helping people to be able to intervene because it helps people to recognize early problematic behavior as actually serious and in need of their intervention. Um, it helps them take personal responsibility, whether they're alone or in a group, that they should take action and have strategies for what they could actually do in situations, um, even those where the offender has greater power, um, and to build their confidence that if they did something, it would actually make a difference. And then, as Jennifer has talked about, we also, you know, when people hear about a situation of sexual harassment or sexual assault, they often jump to ask questions about the victim or the survivor's judgment um, and behavior. And I'm talking about the kinds of questions where we're saying things like, why did she or why didn't she? And these are often asked by people who don't consider themselves to be unsupportive of the survivors. And they're based on that judgment that we would do something differently in that situation. But there's strong research evidence that unless it has happened to people, we're actually really terrible judges of what we would do in a situation where we're faced with inappropriate harassing or violent behavior from someone we know. Um, and so we have to overcome a lot of obstacles um, in these situations when we're the target, but when we're watching or hearing about a situation, then we're actually, all of those are invisible to us. So hindsight, particularly the fact that we're, we know what the end is, makes us think that we would have known something was wrong and we would have been able to do something. But research suggests that we're completely wrong about that. But there, again, there is a solution. Um, we really need help to contradict those tendencies to think we know what the victim or survivor should have done or, and let her lead the process. And Jennifer talked about that. The disclo actually, disclosure training can help us respond better to disclosures um, in our workplaces. And in the process, we can make sure that we're reducing or at least minimally not making worse the trauma for survivors. And then for women, when we're in situations that we expect might be dangerous, we're somewhat prepared. So for most women, things like underground parking lots um, are something we've been socialized all our lives to um, fear and to expect danger. And because we are prepared, we're very sensitive to danger cues and we tend to more quickly trust our judgment if we feel something's off. But 
as we've known for over 30 years, it's not the underground parking lot and the stranger um, that is actually the context where most of the danger to us is likely to find. It's the men we work with and work for, it's our roommates and our friends of friends, and it's homes and parties and hotel rooms and other social events where the risk is highest. And in these situations, everything else that's going on in that situation actually interferes with our ability to detect danger and to trust ourselves to act on it if we do. Um, and we also know that power dynamics can actually magnify um, that problem, and particularly where someone has control over our resources, um, and so the obstacles are even greater. So under those kind of circumstances with acquaintances, we tend to doubt our own judgments of the person and what's happening for much longer. Um, and we're likely to use interpersonal strategies that preserve the relationship and don't prioritize our own rights. Um, and as Jim will talk about shortly, also our brains are also reacting to the stress and shock of what's happening to us. And all those delays actually um, increase the risk to us. So while those are all no completely normal reactions, um, one of the things is we shouldn't think about that as being inevitable. So it's common, it happens. There's, lot, there's ways to work around our natural responses. Um, so through education, we can empower women to trust themselves and their judgments when they perceive that someone is acting in ways that cross their boundaries. Um, to know no matter what happens, it's not their fault. Um, and feminist self-defense training can actually help women realize their strengths and turn fear into anger, which is a very powerful and positive energy, um, and provide practice to use effective strategies to resist um, the particular kinds of strategies that acquaintances use to restrict and restrain women. Um, at the same time, only women themselves know what they should or could do in a situation. But having the, that additional knowledge and tools and practice actually leads to better outcomes, including lower self-blame. Um, so responsibility for all sexual harassment and assault belongs to the perpetrators, but we all need tools to resist their actions. And research shows that using the best practice education, we can empower bystanders, we can empower people to be better supporters and allies, and we can empower women so that they can take effective action on their own behalf. Excellent, thank you. And um, your work nicely links into this because you've looked at <laughs> a lot of these areas. So um, describe to me a little bit about what happens to the brain and um, what, what happens to the memory when some of these experiences occur. Yeah, so one of the big focuses of my work has been what's happening to someone when they're stressed, when they're afraid, when they're terrified. Um, and that can be uh, when someone is just suddenly realizing that they're being betrayed by a boss they thought cared about them and was nurturing their career, and now suddenly they're treating them as an object. So evolution shaped our brains to have certain responses to danger, to have responses to being attacked, whether it's by a predator that wants to eat us or whether it's by a sexual predator who wants to do things to our body that we don't want done. And one of the ways that we can understand this is that we have a circuitry of our brain. Uh, we call it the defense circuitry in neuroscience. And it's a circuitry that's always scanning for danger, and when it detects danger or attack, it shifts how the rest of the brain is working. And one of the things it can do really quickly is shift how people's attention is working. And so their attention becomes grabbed by parts of the experience that seem really crucial to coping and surviving or, or not jeopardizing that relationship or the danger to your career and those sorts of things. But it's very, you know, what we call bottom-up attention. It's attention that's captured by things in the experience that are threatening. And one of the other things this defense circuitry does is it can very rapidly impair that reasoning part of our brain, this prefrontal cortex, this part that allows us to be rational and think things through and make good, sophisticated, flexible decisions. And when stress kicks in and when fear kicks in, within a couple of seconds, that part of our brain can become significantly impaired, sometimes basically taken offline. And when that happens, what do we fall back on? We tend to fall back on habits and reflexes and very simple decision-making processes that are not rational things we're thinking out a lot. And we fall back on habits um, like how to deal with aggressive and dominant people that we've had to deal with in our lives. We may fall back on habits from 
uh, being abused in the home as a child or prior experiences of sexual abuse. We may fall back on habits of how especially girls and women are socialized to deal with unwanted sexual advances that are coming at them so much and how to politely say no without saying no. And, and when the, this defense circuitry takes over, it can make them very vulnerable to, to being manipulated, to being coerced, to being assaulted. Um, and on the surface, it can look like, you know, they might awkwardly smile, they might be engaging in behaviors that on the surface look like it's not such a big deal, but underneath they could be really freaking out. And when things get really extreme, when people are being restrained, when they're being held down and assaulted, when they're really terrified, then they can fall back on really extreme, what I call survival reflexes, where people can actually become paralyzed and unable to move. Sometimes when people are terrified, um, suddenly their blood pressure and heart rate drop and they become dizzy. They may even pass out from fear. There doesn't need to be alcohol involved for people to pass out in certain assaults and their body may go limp. And then the perpetrator, they're like a rag doll. The perpetrator just does whatever they want to them. And so these are responses that evolution put into our brains to survive attack by predators. And it may seem strange to talk about that when we're talking about someone preying on someone in harassment or grabbing someone's butt. Um, but these are the effects that we can see. So for example, Taylor Swift, you know, in her deposition in this case that she recently won, uh, you know, some people would say, oh, well, all he did was grab her butt. But she describes how when he grabbed her butt, she went into shock. She couldn't think straight. She could barely get out the words at this meet and greet she was at. She said it was like my personality was erased. And so these effects can be very, very powerful and dramatic of someone just grabbing you in a certain way or doing something to you that is a betrayal, that is a, treating you like an object. And then finally, in terms of memory, there's these general principles of memory. You know, we're not going to remember everything that happens here. We remember things that we focus attention on. We remember things that are emotionally significant to us. And this gets dramatically amplified when that defense circuitry takes over, when we're under attack. And so certain parts of the experience can get really burned in and other parts that the person's not noticing or don't seem significant to them at the time, they're not getting encoded into their brain. And this we call differential encoding of what really got attention, what was really scary and awful versus the things that didn't get much attention and weren't that significant. This can account for people having memories afterwards that, seem very fra that are very fragmentary. There's lots of pieces missing. Um, and then another thing that can happen is at a certain stage, the brain can have trouble encoding the sequence of things. So you may be taking in that awful sensation of being grabbed or squeezed or penetrated or the smell of whiskey on the person's breath or something like that. But at a certain point, you may not be taking in what sequence that happens. And so like in the case study, to ask someone to narrate something even forward, let alone in reverse, is gonna set them up for inconsistencies in their memory or questioning someone about things that were peripheral details that they didn't even notice you're going to create inconsistencies. And as an expert who works on these cases, I see over and over again the inconsistencies in people's memories are caused by the investigators asking the wrong questions, pushing for information that is not available. And so finally, another thing that really affects memory, it, it, the way stress can affect memory, is when people are trying to retrieve memories, when they're trying to recall, whether telling their friend or telling an investigator, stress impairs retrieval. And so if you're interviewing with a police officer who isn't believing you, who is doubting you, who doesn't understand these principles of memories, who's asking you to do it in reverse, that's pretty stressful. It's stressful enough to talk to a police officer about these horrible experiences. And then people actually can't remember things that are encoded in their brain. And so these are things that we see in terms of how memory can be affected by stress and trauma that are still terribly misunderstood throughout our culture, even among professionals dealing with this. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Fascinating. Maybe we should stay here till midnight tonight. <laughs> There's a lot to return to. Um, Laura, do you want to continue? So I wanted to talk about why we need to have a trauma-informed system. So even in this, some of the discussions today, um, there was talk about how, you know, people complaining about sexual harassment can be called difficult. And it undermines people's credibility. It pathologizes people. And I think generally, a lot of the complex responses that people have when they've been a victim of sexual violence, sexual misconduct, are misunderstood by the public, but often by the survivor themselves. 
So people can't really explain their own psychological responses in coping. So when clients come in and, and see me in therapy, they don't come in and say, I've been overwhelmed and dysregulated by my experience. They'll come in and they'll say, I'm really depressed. I can't sleep at night. Um, I've started drinking a lot. So they describe their symptoms. And if you're not trauma-informed, and this happens when they go to psychiatrists in lots of different places, they get d different diagnoses. And again, that undermines their credibility. People don't see this as someone who's being traumatized and harmed. They see someone who has some issues with mental health. So what happens is a lot of people think we just need policies and procedures. We need these rules in place. People come in and talk about their experiences, and they don't realize that people interpret people's responses. And when people come in, and the way that they talk about their experience um, is often confusing. So I was uh, an expert in a case last year with sexual harassment at work. A woman had been harassed by her supervisor. There was witnesses who talked to her afterwards. And the witness said she sounded crazy. She was confused. She kept talking about the smell of his body. Her story didn't make sense. And the workplace investigator said, I interviewed her. She was all over the map. The story was so fragmented. And when he told the story, he was calm. He was really collected. He told the story in a very consistent, predictable way. And then she said, so I see that he has more credibility than her. And so she saw that this didn't happen. So I think that for anyone who wants to start looking at sexual harassment and sexual misconduct, we need to st first start by being trauma-informed. What do these responses look like? So Jim did a really good job of looking at what happens to the brain of someone when they, they're under um, a moment of threat or stress or fear. But what happens when it's ongoing? So let's look at sexual harassment at work. So the, the torment of going to one's workplace day after day feeling this ongoing sense of threat by someone who has enormous power over you, not just that particular job, but your future. So a lot of people have talked about these ex examples, especially in this industry, of people told just to manage it, just deal with it. But lots of times these aren't just small things that people can deal with. So I've worked with lots of people who have had sexual harassment, and they talk about, first of all, having really, they wake up with dread, but they have a sense of really high, um, what's called hyperarousal. And what that feels like is, is, if you think of something you're really afraid of, a moment of um, maybe flying or public speaking or being evaluated at work, and you have that sort of nervous, fluttery feeling in your stomach, you're having trouble breathing, you can't get your thoughts together, and your hands are kind of shaky, and you think, I can't wait for this day to be over because this is unbearable. But what happens if that's what you feel day after day? That isn't just one day event but every day you wake up and your body's in that dysregulated, jumpy state. Well, people then start to have problems with sleeping, with focusing, calming themselves. And then in order to try to calm themselves, what they'll do is they'll start drinking. Or they'll take medications. Or they stay up all night. And what happens is then they start to have a work performance that's below par. And by the time they get to the point of thinking, I can't tolerate this anymore, I'm going to make a disclosure, they've already lost so much credibility because all these dysregulated ways that they're experiencing their ongoing um, sexual harassment has made them look like a not, a, not a very credible, reliable person. What happens in our brains is that neurons that fire together wire together. And when we're in an ongoing, protracted state of fear or threat, our brain becomes uh, what's called kindling. It, it de develops a pathway to get into that reactivity even easier. So people then become very quick to anger. They become very irritable. And again, I think when we see this idea of people are difficult to work with, we need to start doing a reframe. I know that in this industry, that title really harms people. So we need to see not as people as having difficult, which codes a lot of issues. Rather, these are people who have been harmed. These are people that have been betrayed, you know, that are, that are afraid. One of the other um, ways that people respond is to numb and dissociate. And again, these are very self-protective mechanisms in coping. And again, they don't have a way to talk about that or describe it. And Judith Herman, who's a psychiatrist, said this beautifully. She said, social judgment of chronically traumatized people can be extremely harsh because they're not understood. These issues are not understood. And there's no one response to sexual assault. And for women, we really 
we don't really have a window of what can look appropriate. You know, a lot of people expect people to be helpless, scared, and meek. And if you do that, people have contempt with, well, couldn't they just try harder? Wasn't there something you can do? And women who aren't connected to, are connected to their anger and disconnected from their fear, it's like, this, can't, this is not possible. You couldn't have been harmed because you're, you're not overwhelmed by the experience. You're such a strong person. This could not be... So what is the legitimate way that we can ever respond? So we need to broaden what that looks like and how people can grasp that. One question I, I had is about the role that if somebody is intoxicated or drugged or that, um, that element where there's an additional layer that really fragments memory and maybe starting with you, if you could sort of help deepen our understanding of how we might um, still uncover or, or understand their stories despite those circumstances. Well, so it's important to make distinctions about how intoxicated someone is. Um, someone can be pretty buzzed, they can even be drunk, but if they're not at a level where they're blacking out or passing out, they could still be encoding a lot of information. They could still be taking in those things that were particularly awful about that experience, that were particularly scary, disgusting, terrifying, um, whatever the awful sensations in their body is, these things are being done to them. And so just because someone's pretty buzzed and had a number of drinks and there's a lot of gaps in their memory, doesn't mean that the things that they do remember may not be very accurate and they may never forget them. So that's a really important point to make, that alcohol at moderate levels of intoxication, some other drugs too, they kind of mimic the effects of trauma. People burn in those what we call central details, the things that they couldn't help but notice under this attack, under this harassment, and the things that they weren't noticing, that's not getting encoded. And that more sophisticated encoding of how are these things sequenced in time, alcohol impairs that, even at these moderate doses. So alcohol and, and stress and fear can kind of conspire together to lead to these fragmentary memories, but it doesn't mean that the fragments that are there are not accurate and, and, and really important information to have. Now, when people are at high levels of intoxication, where they're blacked out much of the time, um, still what we see uh, is that they have these little things that I think in the case was this idea of breakthrough things. You know, people, we have this saying like, oh, that sobered me up, right? It didn't really sober you up, but it gave you a burst of these stress chemicals that kind of brought you out of it for a second to, whoa, what's going on here? And the same thing can happen with memory, is people may not be taking in most of the experience, but they'll remember those particularly painful things, or the particularly horrifying things. And sometimes the thing they remember is when they got their hopes up that it was gonna end. And a lot of investigators don't know to listen for this and understand this, but that's sometimes the most memorable moment. When someone who was a bystander, they ducked their head in the door, said, what's going on? They thought it was gonna end, and then it didn't. And other examples like that. But those are some of the main points I would make. That just because someone's drunk and their memory's got a lot of holes doesn't mean that what's there is not very important and could be very accurate. Does anybody want to add anything to that? This is going slightly in a different direction, but it's about alcohol and sexual assault. So um, we often think about alcohol as um, something that the victim is responsible for. But in reality, um, often alcohol is a tool of the perpetrator who uses it and other drugs in order to make it harder for the victim to resist or recognize the, the danger signals. And um, th this is a, a, an example of where institutions have um, a potential to do good or to make things worse. Um, and I was just reading today in one of the prominent psychology journals about a new study that um, documented something that seems um, pretty, pretty, in some sense, obvious, but it had never been documented which is that when universities sell their logos to alcohol um, companies and their advertisements around campus, students have, form a positive association with those, um, those alcohol products and are more likely to, um, to purchase them or whatever. So this is a case where the institution is profiting over selling their logos and um, this behavior, which is um, often, in fact, underage, um, is potentially um, contributing to part of the problem we have by giving a tool to um, perpetrators who can use it to better manipulate their victims. Um, institutions could stop doing this 
And that would be um, what I would call institutional courage instead of institutional betrayal. So one thing in the case study, um, they cited the idea of self-blame. And, um, and I wonder if there are some <laughs> techniques or suggestions on how to counter this or what, how we re might repair or, or um, alter that kind of outcome where um, there is still a lot of self-blame among victims. I think it's really important not to start suddenly saying to the person, you're not to blame. I think we try to talk people out of these belief systems. I think it's really important to think, to ask them, you know, how they think that touch led to this serious sexual assault, to have them take, take you through it. Because they see they, this was just, I mean, I could touch Jim's arm right now. And this does not mean that Jim has the right to sexually assault me later. So looking at consent and actually looking at the offender's behavior. And I think we, t we spend too much time looking at what the victim did. And we don't have enough focus on how deliberate, how intentional, all the different things that he did to, um, to like giving her drugs, giving her alcohol, making sure she was brought to the party and leading her to his apartment. But being able to get to see all those components of what he did. And that's not gonna be a one-time story. It's gonna take many times for her to be able to grasp that and shift her understanding. But I, and I also think the idea of just, and I think Jennifer already talked about this, just validating and believing the person really helps. And I like to talk about, talk about it as the neurobiology of connection. But one thing that we really need to think about is how can we make this person feel as safe and connected with me in this moment right now? And I think any of us in our different contexts should be thinking, how can I take this brain out of threat? Because when their brain is out of threat, they are able to integrate and take in information more effectively. And so I think it's a practice that we, we all need to have. Because I think then you'll see shifts happen much faster. If we can help people understand that these are normal brain-based responses to being betrayed and attacked by other people and being under high stress, that can be part of some of the knowledge we can bring even as we explore their understandings. And you know, sometimes these habit behaviors that people engage in, you know, in a Marine Corps case I worked on, this woman just kept saying, you're married, you don't need to be doing this, you're married, you don't need to be doing this. Later, she was confused, embarrassed, ashamed, like, how come that's all I said all the way up to the point where this guy is raping me? Yes. Well, when the brain is overwhelmed and you lose that prefrontal cortex, you're running on habits. And if you don't have habits for resistance and for defending yourself, you may fall back on habits to maintain the relationship, to protect that sort of thing. And that's all you've got. That's all you've got. And it's just the brain under attack, falling back on habits when you don't have effective ones. And to help people understand that can be helpful as well. People, one reason people blame themselves, and it's, there's more than one reason, um, but one is that they're looking for an explanation. And if, if it's something they did, maybe they can change things so that next time it won't happen. Um, but if in fact, it's really not something they did, that thinking is not actually very helpful. But what is helpful um, is, is it, um, being able to identify um, whose responsibility it is. So, um, and this is something we can do as a community for somebody because we can say, you know, it's, not, it, it's the perpetrator who did this um, particular thing. Um, and what's especially powerful is an apology. Now, it's really hard to get an, a, perp a perpetrator to apologize. Sometimes they do. But communities can apologize. And by doing that, they're taking some of this um, accountability. And that helps relieve the person who's the victim from having to hold it all themselves. I think we can also sort of as co-workers or as, um, as people in, in the community, we can say, you know, sort of there is no person who was not intent on committing this particular crime, who would not read that as what it was intended to be, a friendly act, something of clearly, I'm not interested because I keep saying you're, you're married, you don't need to, be. that is not a sign of consent. And so re, I think just as a, as a, a supportive person, we can also give that back and say that that is not that. Right? That's not how I read it. That's not how anybody, anybody who was not intent on hurting you would read it. So in our case study, Leif says she feels betrayed by Tom, but not just him. She feels betrayed by the bystanders who 
were at the party and um, they watched her being led out. So well, in a way, it's a, a it's sort of a good sign that she can even identify being betrayed because a lot of people get betrayed and they can't put that word on it. Um, they don't they if they've really got powerful betrayal blindness going on, they, in fact, they won't put that word on it. Um, they will blame themselves, not the other person. Um, they will tell stories to make what happened have a different explanation and so on. Um, but once when somebody does feel betrayed, it's a um, usually pretty strong, sharp, negative feeling. And um, it usually inspires action of withdrawal or confrontation. If those aren't possible actions, then it tends to get directed inward. But what we know from, from our studies is that when the when the institution compounds that, as occurred in this story, um, the, the harm that people experience is really exacerbated. It's made a lot worse. Um, and so healing involves, among other things, learning how to um, trust again, um, which, and trust has to be earned, and learning how to evaluate whether somebody is trustworthy, which, if the betrayal starts in childhood, can be you know, it can be a significant undertaking to relearn that. Nobody should, should trust, ju though, just because they're told to trust. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that yeah. sets people up for betrayal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, one question is also about intervention, and you've done some work around interventions. What are some other examples of um, effective interventions? I think that in most, um, I've heard about some terrible sort of workplace practices where basically the, the um, education is that you do PowerPoint slides of what the policy is, right? And you make everybody a mandatory attendance. We know that that is a good way to really bore people silly and not actually to accomplish anything at all. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we can do that's most simple, really, in many ways, is to do the basic kind of how to handle disclosures in appropriate ways, what not to do. And um, most of that kind of training can actually be done in a relatively short period of time, um, quite effectively if it's done by the right people. And that would instantly make sure that people, if someone is disclosing to a coworker or to someone that they do trust, that the response they get is a supportive response. And that's like a first line, to me, that really is a first line thing that we could do. I don't know what other people um, mm -hmm. sort of view about that, but it's, it's, it's relatively simple. Anyone can do it. They can learn what never to say, for example. You know, why did you never say it? Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Right? That's the end of it? Yeah. It starts to come... Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think we really do need to create contexts in which it is everyone's responsibility to, um, to change the climate, to step up, and, to, and, and which we really say when you see these things. We're telling you that these acts that, we, um, that people often think are not important, these, you know, the sexualized uh, comments about people's bodies, the, the jokes that are degrading and demeaning to women or to um, sexual minorities, to the, all of those kind of the, the bumping into people, these are important acts that should be intervened. Uh, there should be intervention in those because there, this is part of the continuum that supports the things that we as a society think are more serious. So if you don't attack those, then you're not going to attack the more serious things. And so I think those are re really important things. I think also events like this, I mean, I think one of the, it goes to the business of being trauma-informed. One of the, the things that can so make a difference is when people understand um, what trauma and sexual violence does to people and um, stop being harshly judgmental, believing that they know what they would do in a yes. circumstance, yes. Um, start to have a more open mind and a compassionate mind. But I, do, I want to say one thing about this disclosure, teaching people how to be good listeners. Um, we don't educate in this society about that. So this is not, it's, this is not difficult education. We just don't do it. Um, it could be part of our primary education. Former student Melissa Foynes in my lab and I did a study 
that um, involved an extremely simple intervention. We had people half randomized into two groups, and half of the people learned some listening tips. It was a one-page tip sheet, and they, we made sure they really learned it. They were quizzed. And the other half had a control condition that was healthy living tips. And they um, learned this, and we compared what happened before and after they learned this. And they really actually engaged in a disclosure with somebody. It was true. We filmed it. The, the individuals who had this one-page tip sheet went on to a much more positive disclosure experience than the ones who hadn't, which I think goes to show partly how much ignorance we're starting with, that in you know, one page could make such a difference. But it also, I think, shows that this is not th that hard, and it's just um, really institutional will. This is this like institutional courage. We could do this, and we could start doing it right now. There was a beautiful story that the Global Mail published mm -hmm. in April, and it's about, again, how do we reach people, because we often think it's just saying the right words. And it was a story about a man who jumped on the subway uh, tracks. And the TTC worker rushed to the platform, sat down, so he had eye contact, listened. He asked the man what was wrong, but then listened to him. Because mo what most people do is start making demands because they're scared and anxious. He sat down and he listened to him. He told the man to breathe. He brought him into his body. And then he said, say after me, I'm strong. And then he got people, the bystanders on the platform, to say, I am strong, you're strong as well. So he created a sense of community. And with all the intervention, the man came up onto the platform and everyone applauded. And I don't know who trained him, but those are the kind of moments of, we have to think not just of our words, that we have to think, how are we using our voice? How do we get people back into their bodies? How do we calm people and let them know that we're there with them, to have that deep connection? Because we try, we rely too much on just thinking, if I say the exact right thing, then it's gonna help rather than I have to be in my own body and feel calm and connected to you, and then you're going to feel calm and connected as well. There, the, one of the really important points you made is that people are often trying to manage their own anxiety, and they, they mess up in responding, um, not because they have bad intentions. I mean, some people do, mm -hmm. but a lot of people have good intentions, and they still mess up because they're managing their own anxiety. And so one of the things in the tip, the tip sheet actually is about body things and what the listener can do with their own body to help them be a better listener and manage their their own anxiety um, so yeah these are teachable these are teachable um, if we had to prioritize three or four ways of moving forward what would you say are some of the important ones I mean you know I'll focus on the things that I often mm -hmm. teach about and I think there's a lot that can be done to just educate people about how our bodies and how our brains respond in high stress situations and when we're under attack. And this education can go out to actors, it can go out to the media, it can go to talent agents, it can go to anybody who's open to learning about it with those good intentions. And when you have that knowledge, then you understand that all these preconceptions you have about what you would do, that's your prefrontal cortex talking. And when you're under stress and you're impaired, that's not what's running the show. And so that's just a basic thing, just help people understand this is how our bodies and brains respond under stress and under attack. And then we can build this insti in, into institutions and train people in institutions and train them to work with this when people are disclosing to them and not to jump to conclusions, not to just tell people, oh, you should do this or forget about it or all the things that, that people tend to do. And finally, and, and the memory issues too, right? how memories are affected by stress and trauma and how we should have realistic expectations for what people are going to remember and what is likely to be accurate and what could get distorted by a bad investigation. Um, so that's really important for people to know. I could see, you know, instructions to the jury about some things we know about memory that could inoculate them against a lot of the manipulations that are done and that, and that work on judges as well as juries uh, in, your, in your country and ours. So the film industry is really in a unique position to educate the public and to change culture and to change many institutions by telling compelling stories, fictional stories, documentaries, dramas. And, but it's going to take uh, collaborating with people like us. Uh, and there's actually been research done on what kind of shows people watch. There's a number of shows that talk about sexual assault and have dramas of sexual assault. And some of them uh, perpetuate a lot of myths and a lot of misunderstanding. And some of them are better than others. All of them could do a lot better. Um, but some people are really making efforts to educate people. 
But the content of those shows, the myths and the confusion that is in those shows is, is, is causing problems. But the ones that are doing a better job, that's helping. And so I think there's a real potential for collaboration. You know, we would love to share what we've learned from years of, of research and our clinical work um, with people who are writing films, who are directing and producing them, uh, because we, we really want to help in that way as well. That's fascinating. Um, does anybody else want to jump in with what they see as some of the most important recommendations they can think of? The one I was wanting to suggest, because this has come up a lot, is that people um, are not able to get any kind of care in mental health when they've been harmed by sexual harassment. And I think that, you know, there's been a concern about the long waiting lifts. And one thing I want to do is just, I wanted to talk about the complexity and trauma informed because I want people to understand there's a broader range of ways that people can, can handle these um, intense dysregulated states that they have. It doesn't always have to be going to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, that there's a, a lot of ways that people can do yoga for trauma, there's mindfulness practice, there's um, neural feedback to help them change how their brain fires, there's, you know, biofeedback. All these are helping people calm a dysregulated nervous system because that drives a lot of people's drinking and cutting and um, inability to focus or to be able to sleep well. So I, th I worry about us thinking that we can only um, get help if we see a professional but in the meantime, I think there are things that people can do. Because I know there's a real desperation people feel that help is just not available. So I think we need to see it in a, in a broader way. Okay, so other strategies, coping mechanisms too. Okay, anything else? Well, I, you know, I think right now um, it would be extremely um, helpful if we educated people in positions of power at, you know, at um, you know, all sorts of industries, including the entertainment industry, about um, how to be good listeners, what trauma reactions look like, and also what to look for and be wary about in, in perpetrator behavior. And we tend to focus on victims, as Lori has pointed out, but we, um, we really need to keep looking at perpetrators. And um, I, I guess I just want to pull us back to this concept of DARVO for a minute because I'm seeing so much of it going on right now um, and people getting away with it and um, it, it's really horrifying when you see somebody being accused by multiple women and managing to get away with claiming they're all lying um, and that they're all crazy and, and then when institutions around that person are supporting that it, it's um, really harmful and I have recently been calling this institutional DARVO. Um, one version of this that's really, really scary is when um, the police actually charge a rape victim with lying. And very often when that happens, it's later found out that the rape victim was not lying. But can you imagine what that's like when you've been raped and you report it and then you get arrested for lying? I mean, that's an extreme case. But, um, but you know, this sort of thing goes on all the time in maybe slightly less extreme but still really harmful way. So I think we need to do this education so people recognize the pattern and when they see it, call it out and don't go along with it. So people better understand uh, perpetrators' tactics or strategy and what they are doing yes. to undermine the person. Yes. Yeah. Call them out for what they are. Call them out, yeah. For, for me, one of the things is for us to realize um, in recommendations that there is no one, there's no magic pill. There's not one thing, and then if we do that one thing, like we've done it, and it's enough. It has to be a comprehensive plan that we, we have to do it on all the levels, and we have to keep doing the next level. Um, as soon as we think we've accomplished anything at all, we should do as much as possible and do it better. And we should use the evidence of what actually works. Um, because there's actually a fair amount of research showing what doesn't work. Um, and we don't want to be doing, wasting our time and energy and resources um, on doing those things. We should do what works. Mm -hmm. So those are some great recommendations. And I'll just <clears throat> return towards the end um, to where we started, which is looking specifically at the film industry and some of this, the extreme power imbalances that can happen there. So just a last question is about... Um, Again, when, when somebody discloses something and there's a layer of uh, an agent, a manager, and all the layers up and they don't have this training, how might we rectify that or get 
go around the particular dynamics in this industry to improve things? I was part of a, a, you know, a discussion earlier today where they wanted exactly what Charlene said, which is just give us a way to have the policies and procedures. And I think that it's, it's not effective. I don't think that's, a, that's an effective way to learn. And so the approach that I take when I work with police is the first thing is I don't want to use a shame approach. I start out by saying none of us want to enter our fields and do work and actually harm people. I want to, so I appeal to the best part of people. None of us want to make those mistakes. And we want to be able to help people. And so I think we need to do approaches that bring people on side, want them to think, I want to be able to help the, the actors I work with, and give them not only knowledge but skills and practice and really comprehensive information so that they can feel some sense of efficacy and feel that they have resources where they can make appropriate referrals and offer some protection. Because I think right now they're, they're, they're worried, what do we do with this information? Someone discloses to us, and I'm not going to be very good with the disclosure if I have no idea what's the next step. So it has to be transparent and very clearly outlined for everyone, and so people can fall through the, with those stages. So I think there's big gaps right now, and I think we can really prioritize who is the person that the actress will go to first, or the crew, and start there. Because I think that's how we start to shift a culture as well. That there's, there's transparency, there's more people talking about it, and there's going to be a shared language of, of understanding of what needs to be done. I think there's two, two other things that are related to that is that, for example, if you e really educate the people that um, actors are going to, then it isn't, it's no longer the case where um, the institution or, or the perpetrator can isolate that one person and say that they're crazy because there's somebody else standing beside them, hopefully a lot of somebody's in their union, for example, who are saying, well, no, wait a second, that's, that's not what this is. We, we're calling it out for what it is because we actually know more about it now. And then actually, I mean, we know in organizational change that having champions in positions of power can really start to shift people's willingness to hear the new lessons or to, to really be changing. So I think that would be another strategy, would be to, at every level, if there's somebody who's really respected in, within the unions, if there's somebody who's really um, respected as a director or a producer, then getting a few people who really understand and care about this, who are saying to their peers, we must do something about this, we need to learn, then that can create an environment which can really mean that those lessons aren't like, oh, do we have to go to this? Um, but rather like, oh, I'm, I really want to know how, I, how we can change this. And not just knowledge, but skills, yes. skills, skills and habits. You yeah. change culture through new habits of yeah. thinking and listening and responding to people. And it can't be just, you know, knowledge and policies on a piece no. of paper, or no. an email from the CEO saying, yeah. we're zero tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. You I have think to you have, have habits. And, and, you, and you need to do what we're doing here again, which is diving deep. It's not, it's not the mindless, um, passive, this is what you have to do kind of education, but it's really trying to understand and unpack. And we could go we could talk for 20 hours and keep diving deeper and deeper and we really need that i mean we really need to be doing that kind of work together i was hoping we would do that tonight <laughs> <laughs> we can keep going yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but thank you very much uh the recommendations are i hope they will be listened to they're very interesting and um i really appreciate your time so thank you thank you thank you, thank you.